Good afternoon, welcome. Uh, I'm Joe Pichon, the Director of the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. I'm desired to welcome you today um, to our second evidence session of 2023 for the Productivity Commission, which is part of the ESRC Fund for Productivity Institute that is run out of the Alliance Business School in Manchester. Um, wonderful to be joined by the witnesses we have today. I'll turn to them shortly and after an opening statement, but also our commissioners, um, some of whom are in the room with us and many of whom are online. I should say our sessions are open, so we have um, a large number of people who are monitoring uh, through the interweb or the <coughs> um, as well as, um, as, 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 well as um, uh, our observer uh, and kindly uh, it's been kindly supportive of this process with me and Stephen Aldridge from DLUC, um, just across the road, and our senior fellows who are going to be involved in helping us write the final report, Catherine Mann and Paul Fisher. I'm delighted as well that Paul in particular is able to join us uh, this afternoon. Thank you, Paul, for coming as well. Um, the purpose of the Productivity Commission is to understand further the problem that the United Kingdom faces in the context of global <coughs> slowdown in many advanced economies, but one which has a particular resonance in the UK. Um, and what we're doing this year in particular is trying to collect evidence on investment. That information or evidence that we collect on investment will be turned into a report that we hope to publish towards the middle of the year, following up with some policy, policy suggestions, uh, which will be a report that we're producing um, later on in the year. Um, absolutely willing to receive written evidence from anyone who wishes to, those online who get ideas from what's being listened to uh, or watched this afternoon. We've received an, a large number of, of uh, uh, pieces of written evidence, which we're very grateful. I think most of them are available on our website, but do feel free to construct further bits of written evidence here if you wish, and do feel free to continue to put questions to us as well. Um, I should say, if you're listening online, you, that if you do want to put in questions to the witnesses, send them down the chat. Please give your name and affiliation. We'll try to come to them. If we don't come to them, we will certainly note, it, note them and come back to you at some point uh, in the future. There's no question of uh, ignoring what it is uh, that you're saying to us. So I think that further ado, rather than introducing everyone who's there, I will turn to the witnesses if I can and just simply ask them in say two minutes to introduce themselves um, and also perhaps give a, a start of an answer to the following question, um, which is what role do you think greater public investment would play in solving the productivity problem and how much do you think we need? <coughs> and if I could start with Nigel. So I'm Nigel Griffield. I'm a professor of international business, which basically means I studied the uh, who, what, where, why, and when of the location decisions. Um, in the context of the UK, that was a lot of work on human investment and operative and so on. Um, so if I, my answer actually to that question kind of changed about three months ago, that the, the Inflation Reduction Act has kind of changed the world in this space. I think that uh, public financing for R&D, for innovation, for investment, to crowd in private money is, is back in vogue in a way that we probably haven't seen since, I was going to say the 1980s, but I'm almost tempted to say the 1950s. Um, the US and China are talking billions. Um, you, you did say, you know, sort of how much, how much do we think we need? Well, they're, they're talking billions. Um, we champion 35 million each for three locations. Um, <coughs> honestly, what I would do if I would think about, well, I would, I'll use the term deliberately that the IZs, and we can avoid use distinguishing between innovation and uh, innovation and investment for a minute. I would kind of add all of that up and add on a zero, and then decide if that was anywhere near enough. That would be my son. Thank you very much, Lauren. Jerry. Good afternoon. Jerry Holtham, I'm suffering from slight imposter syndrome, which shows that I'm man of very poor sensitivity, but actually I'm a total imposter. The, um, most of my career has been spent in finance and macroeconomics, but about 10 years ago, I got involved 
with uh, Cardiff Metropolitan University, their uh, Creative Leadership and Enterprise Centre. And we've engaged on a series of studies of productivity in, in companies in Wales. And um, we've done a fair amount of statistical analysis of regional databases and, and things like that. But the most, I think, informative work we've done is actually going out and talking to a large number of small to medium sized companies and asking them how they, what productivity means to them, how they monitor it, um, what role they think it has in their productivity. And, just looking at what they do and whether it seems to work. Um, we looked at, we sent a questionnaire to several hundred companies, conducted structured interviews of over 70. I personally did about 30. So I think most of our insights are really on a, on a micro level of how we might go about encouraging positive increases in companies, particularly small companies. Cuts less, I think, on the um, on the on the big picture, on the macro, on the macro picture. Um, so anything I say now is pure prejudice. Um, but I think I think the, I think the um, you know we have gone through a period where it was considered we had policies based on um, on sort of neoclassical economics. Uh, so okay, we're marking those best. The government should not distort, should not distort decisions by subsidizing this or, or, or penalizing that, and taxes should be as low as possible. So we had this drive to reduce the uh, corporation tax and to remove all, all um, incentives for you know for investment or for research or what can you? And uh, I think not just because other people are now doing something different. But there's just a general observation, not yet done to work very well. I mean, we had a low rate of tax and we still have a low rate of investment. So where's the payoff? And given the public sector needs the money, why don't we take it off? And if they then want to invest, well, we give them back. You know, I mean, win win. It's a very crude argument, but I must say I have some sympathy with it. It seems to me that it's based on experience, not on not on rather regime theorizing. And um, so, yeah, and you know, provide incentives and raise the taxes. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we'll turn next to uh, Jan Inspelt, who's joining us uh, down the line uh, from Brussels. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Yadid. I hope uh, you can hear me well. Um, we hear a bit of a lot of noise from the room, but uh, I hope you can hear me correctly. Yeah. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to take part in this discussion. Uh, I'm looking forward to an interesting uh, discussion on public investments. Uh, by way of background, my uh, career is in macroeconomic modeling, and I'm head of the sector uh, model-based economic analysis in DG Action at the European Commission. Now, I should say uh, up front that the usual disclaimer applies here, that I'm here in a personal capacity, and obviously not speaking on behalf of the European Commission. I'm also not claiming to be an expert on the UK economy, but I hope that as an EU-based macroeconomist, I can provide a European angle to the discussion and to give you some insights on how the macroeconomic literature sees the role of public investment in supporting growth. I think there are many similarities between the UK and the EU member states. Uh, in most advanced economies, there has been a tendency for the share of public investment to decline as pressure for fiscal consolidation increased. And that's what we've seen in the previous decades. I think by now, uh, in recent years, we've come to recognize how damaging this trend has been and how important it is to support public investment to boost growth. Uh, public investment is a main driver of uh, TFP combined with uh, R&D and uh, human capital investment, of course. But uh, it's certainly uh, an important driver of, um, of growth. In the EU, we have now the RRF, the Recovery and Resilience Facility, which makes about 800 billion euros available for investment and reforms. Now you ask how much investment is needed. I think there are two ways of approaching that question. Uh, there's little agreement among economists about what the socially optimal level of public capital and investment will be. And this depends crucially on the intrinsic productivity of public capital. The macroeconomic estimates of productivity vary widely, and it's very <coughs> difficult to pin down exactly. But economists that have tried to calculate the socially optimal level of public investment find that under only under extreme pessimistic views of this productivity, could one argue that the current levels of public investment are optimal? 
most estimates of productivity are higher. And the implication then is that the socially optimal level of public investment could also be higher than what we see today in most advanced economies. And we are underinvesting in, um, in public capital. I think another way of addressing your question is to see it in the context of what is, I think, the most pressing issue at the current juncture, and that's the green transition. Uh, what are the investment needs for us to meet the net zero emission targets by 2050? It's very difficult to quantify that precisely, but it's almost definitely huge. Uh, the estimates are around 2 to 3% of GDP additional investment per year compared to past decades, up to 2030 and more thereafter. So these are huge numbers, 2 to 3% of GDP as additional investment to meet our climate targets. Now, of course, the lion's share of that may have to come from private investments, but still a large share would have to come from public investments. And I think it's clear that so far at least, public investment has failed to reach anything like the level it needs to get to in order to meet our climate objectives. <laughs> but leave it at that for now. Thank you very much, Jan. Sorry, may I then turn to Urashi. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. I am Urashi Parashar. I am Chief Impact Officer and Chief Economist at uh, the UK Infrastructure Bank. We are a very new policy bank, perhaps first of a kind in the UK, and an infrastructure bank uh, set up about um, 18 months ago. Um, we have a very clear mandate, uh, quite, quite a focus. <coughs> Set of missions and just flowing from what everyone has said you know we've got um to solve problems on two very urgent things tackling climate change and supporting local and uh regional economic growth and we've got 22 billion pounds worth of financial capacity so of course i believe that this investment will contribute to growth and productivity um and you know whether we can size up the, with precision uh, the level of public investment that is required, we, as, as Jan was saying, that number, at least on the net zero side, and also in addressing spatial inequalities, is pretty big. So we really believe, I believe, that you know the bank's mission uh, and the strategic objectives uh, will, will deliver those those benefits to growth and productivity. And just to give a bit of bit of background as well, before I joined the bank, I was part of the Living Up Task Force, um, uh, delivering the Living Up White Paper with um, Andy Hanley. Thank you. Well, thank you much, Rashi, for coming along uh, today. Just to put that in context, 22 billion pounds is less than 1% of GDP. Is that right? Just <clears throat> it's still important. No, no, I didn't say it wasn't. I was simply yeah, scaling it, if I may say. Thank you very much, Rashi. Um, so, I think uh, I don't see any immediate questions. So, I think one thing I get from all of those statements is a common thread. Um, I don't know who it was that economists always disagree. It sounds like actually they're agreeing <laughs> that we need more public investment. It seems to me that's uh, the sense in which Jan put it very well. It doesn't, it doesn't look like, under any reasonable calibration, that the level we currently have it is optimal. And optimality <laughs> would require, I think, it, it suggests. I need to increase rather than reduce. Uh, we seem to be at the lower bound of what looks reasonable at the moment. And that's an interesting observation in a world that seems to be dominated by uh, fiscal consolidation, austerity, or the move to sound money, which, whichever phrase you use reveals your own views on these things, I think. Um, now, I think we're going to ask Stephen to take the first round of questions on um, sizing public investment. Stephen is just going to lead on the section. I should say if other commissioners want to ask or follow up, please do or, or raise a hand in the chat and we'll ensure that you come in at the appropriate time. So Stephen, I'd like to turn to you as the Director for Macroeconomics here at the Institute. Thank you. So I'm already quite worried because Avashi has already told us that it's really, really hard to size up how much public investment is needed. <laughs> I didn't um, so except that we need a lot more. I think I'm taking that out. I'm taking the same message away uh, as Jack just said. But I was wondering, Avashi, starting with you, if you could identify where, where the gaps are in public investment. We may not know how much exactly, but we may have a better idea for where that investment needs to go. 
Well, I'll, I'll pull I'll pull from um, what in my experience from having done the leveling up white paper and now in you know within the remit of the bank. I think you know I don't need to reprise all the figures that's out there in the open about infrastructure investment flows. You know, we are here to contribute to more infrastructure in the right sectors that need transition to net zero and spread opportunity across the UK. And what the Living Up White Paper also said is that you know, in infrastructure investment in itself is not going to be the silver bullet. It's, you know, in the six capitals framework, it said that you need, you know, it, it's part, we have to look at it, we have to take a systems approach and look at it as part of the ecosystem. And it's really about understanding the ecosystem uh, that, you know, you start, like I would start my homework with. So, we, you know, infrastructure investment will be pretty crucial in transitioning to net zero and addressing you know, spatial inequalities, but you will need the skills, you need the R&D, you will need you know, other things to work uh, in tandem. Um, and, and that's equally important. And the one thing that the bank is here to do is to crowd in private capital. So our, our mandate is very clear that we are here to partner with the private sector to invest in infrastructure. The 22 billion is on loans, equities, and guarantees. And we have to balance financial returns that the investments make with um, demonstrating additionality. So that's mm -hmm. what we have been doing on each of the deals, is making sure that we are crowding in capital. We are not, you know, it's, it's in the spirit of collaboration. And we're going to learn more. We've done, you know, our initial deals in the first 18 months. And we are going to learn more from what, what that means. Some of the sectors we are investing in are very, very nascent. But we know the big figures that um, the Skidmore Review, for example, and Powering of Britain said, you know, uh, and some of the other publications, the Desnes has published, says, you know, you need 50 to 60 billion worth of additional capital to transition to net zero. So we're quite aware of that, but we're also quite clear about our role in um, in, in that bit. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I just have a comment. It's absolutely not about um, questioning UK IB and what it's doing. We're, we're, we're really trying to look at its conception, so please don't get the wrong idea. But just to follow up on your six capitals point, which is yeah. well taken and well made, let me be clear about that. But if I was thinking about this um, as an economist, would I be right in saying that, are, you, are we saying that the multiplier, so the long run impact on potential GDP from a sluggish public investment will be greater if the other six, other five capitals are also in place in the right way? Object and and, and yeah. would be considerably less than, than otherwise were they not in place? Well, objectively yeah. speaking, as, a, as, an, as an economist who's worked on foreign policy for a long time and actually in delivering some of the programs, on R&D, yes, you know, you would have to, but it's not one size fits all either. You know, you can't just, I've never been a macroeconomist. I've always worked on microeconomics and you need to look at it bottom up as well as top down, you know. That's Thank you. Sorry, Stephen, I just wanted to No, I think it will, will be interesting. So um, you need to look at it bottom up, not just top down. So I'm, I'm gonna to go to Yan. Um, I know you are a macro modeler uh, who looks at things top down. Where, where would you say are, are the areas where public investment affects the supply side of the economy? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, as a, as a macroeconomist, of course, I'm not a specialist in, in, in the micro aspects and in particular projects, but I, I mentioned already earlier, I think it's the green transition that is certainly urgent now. Uh, also, energy security, of course, has become in the last... Um, in, in, in the last year, a very urgent issue to, to invest in. Um, I think the, the point that um, Uwashi made is that there also, of course, there are important synergies. Uh, it's not just public investment. One also has to think certainly in terms of R&D. Um, R&D, of course, is part of public investment in the national accounts. Uh, it, 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 R&D spending is counted as public investment. But uh, what also matters, of course, is then uh, human capital investment. So I can also see that in our type of modeling, 
R&D output depends on the skill, the, the share of scientists in our models. So it's, it's the skill structure that also matters. So it's uh, not too narrow a uh, perspective on, on just infrastructure investment is needed. I think one has to broaden it to also see uh, investments in, in human capital and investment in R&D. Uh, sectorally, I think uh, the focus is certainly in the EU on, on the green sector. Uh, the green and digital transition are certainly our priority. And I think there uh, the, the emphasis should be at the current juncture. Okay, thanks very much, Jan. Um, Nigel, can I turn to you again? The, the question is, where, where should the public investment be? if we are going to boost productivity? So I think I'd, I'd start by making a, a key distinction between, if you like, infrastructure and everything else that you could perhaps label as skills and R&D. There'd be more stuff in that, obviously, if we start with that. Um, the, one of the fundamental problems that we have with, if you like, infrastructure in this country is travel to work areas are too small. You know, um, I wrote a, the, the, the sort of state of the Midlands piece that I wrote for, for TPI is, is really clear on this. But if you look particularly at the East Midlands, there are people who, by public transport, cannot access jobs 30 miles away. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that it can take an hour and 40 minutes by public transport to get from the sort of North Nottinghamshire ex fields into Nottingham. So you just can't, you can't do that, right? Um, you know, if you're working as a dental hygienist or something where you actually need to be there, you can just can't do it. Um, the, the missing, I mean, I'm, I'm, re I was at, I, I'm actually really persuaded by your colleague, sorry, your colleague, Richard Jones, um, missing four billion. We're missing four billion of, of public R&D public R outside London. I mean, that's a, you can start with that and then <laughs> multiply it from there. Um, but they, they would kind of be the two things. Um, on, on skills in general, so this is kind of a, a counterfactual perhaps of, of Jagjit's question, and I don't know whether it's helpful here or, or later, but so take my region. We have a whole load of people and, and the transition to net zero and the green economy. There are a whole load of people in my region who are very skilled in things that are about to become redundant. Who in this room could put petrol tank in a car? Without the car blowing, without the car, without the car blowing up when you think, you know, it's 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 not a it's not a trivial exercise. Yeah. But the people who do that, they are that that is about to become a redundant activity, and they're not going to transition immediately into batteries because it's a completely different skill set. They might transition into heat pumps, for example. But somebody's then got to not somebody's got to prime the demand for those skills because heat pumps are expensive. You know, how many people in this room would pay 16, 16,000 pounds for what is effectively a new boil? So someone's got to someone's got to put the money in. That's just one example. But if you think about the transition to net zero, there are loads of examples like that that need public sector intervention. <coughs> Otherwise, they're just a, the market will not do it. Thank you. And um, finally, Joe. <clears throat> yeah, I think it might help me out to make a distinction between supporting uh, existing activities and making the, you know, the, the economy is currently constituted more efficient and transformative activities where you're actually trying to really change the basis of, of um, what we can do. I think as far as the, the former is concerned, uh, our experience in talking to lots of companies is that by far the most important <coughs> is the human capital side. I think you know, we talked to 80 companies or whatever it was, Maybe two complained that the physical infrastructure was impeding their business. 90% of them said what's impeding our business is we can't get the right people. Or we can't get the people with the skills, and if we train them ourselves, somebody else will look up. So from that point of view, it really seems as if the at the business as usual level, um, the, the real gap is on the is on the human capital side. Now for radical transformation of the economy, of course, that, that changes things a lot. The, the instances that the Professor Griffith was mentioning to are cases in point. And I, what one says about what one can say about that is we've got a terrible habit of losing our nerve in this country. Because if you're going to have a transformation, 
you're probably going to have to make very large investments. And we start off thinking we're going to make a large investment, and at some point, there's a fiscal squeeze, and we all lose that nerve, and we start cutting the corners, and we start cutting the costs. So we're going to have a high-speed rail system from London to, to Glasgow. Well, perhaps we won't bring it back into London, we'll stop it you know, <laughs> from starting somewhere, and then we'll, we'll take it to Birmingham, we'll, we'll think a bit more of you know, there's no point. I mean, I would do it, and then I would do it. And we, we, I don't think the government in this country, it's very much got the accountancy mindset. And um, how we ever get to get the sort of French attitude of, you know, it's a grand projet and we're just going to do it, I don't know. But I think the transformational investments really have to be bolder. I mean, you know, we've been talking about a 10, a, a seven, Barrage that would provide 7.5% of the total electricity requirements of the country for at least 30 years. And we're doing it now because people are frightened of the big numbers. Thank you. Um, so, Varshi, you mentioned uh, the, the role of UK in sort of ensuring that uh, public investment crowded in private mm -hmm. mm -hmm. investment. Yeah. Um, I'm going to come back to you in a minute, but first I want to go to Jan who um, I know you've done a lot of modeling of the effects of public investment. Do you, do you tend to find that public investment crowds out private investment, crowds in private investment? It depends on the project. What are your thoughts on that in general? Um, I think it depends uh, very much on the circumstances. Um, of course, there's always the concern and it has been the concern of uh, public investment crowding out private investments. Um, I think that uh, could have been true through a channel like uh, free interest rates, uh, more demand, uh, public investment would create more demand and therefore raise real interest rates. Now, I think in the last decade, we are of course near a zero lower bound uh, and uh, this real interest rate effect would not have been there. And there would have been a positive co-movement between public investment and private investments. I think uh, what also matters, of course, greatly is how public investment is financed. Uh, at the end of the day, public investment has to be paid for. And uh, if it is paid for by distortionary taxes, uh, like an increase in corporate tax rates, then of course, there would be a negative growth effect from that channel on private investments. So it also depends on uh, how we can shift the tax burden to pay for pu more public investments away from distortionary taxes to less distortionary taxes like uh, property taxes or land value taxes or uh, environmental and green taxes. I think on the whole, the literature finds that uh, just looking at complementarity, uh, that there is some indication of uh, public and private investment being complementary. That is, uh, an increase in public investment would also lead to a positive uh, increase in, in, in private investment. So I think the literature seems to think that there's a seems to indicate that there's a positive co-movement and a complementarity. So I think we are less worried about crowding out at the current junction. Fantastic. Thanks, Jan. Uh, Avershi, I said I'd come back to you. I was wondering if maybe if you could talk us through how uh, the UK Investment Bank is sort of achieving that crowding in. Yeah, yeah. So, so additionality and crowding in are sort of hardwired into our policy design. So we, you know, in, in the sense that, as I said, it's in our framework document of the treasury set and it's something it's part of our investment principles so we have to test that for every you know in every deal that um uh, that we do um we also have five priority sectors some of them are pretty have pretty nascent technologies like clean energy which will eventually become our biggest part of our yeah. portfolio has you know, technologies and hydrogen, carbon capture, you know, they're very, very nascent. And sometimes those markets don't even exist. So the, the way that we are framing the crowding in and testing it is, in, I would say three different ways. One is we're helping commercialize new business models. Uh, we are scaling up or accelerating innovation and, um, you know, in, in uh, technologies and in infrastructure in those sectors. And in some cases where the sectors and the technologies are very, very nascent, 
we will all be there and will facilitate new investors to come in and create those markets like battery storage and you know all the um hydrogen technologies so the, you know the 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 the, the the definition of crowd crowding in is not set as such. What it means is that sometimes we would crowd in at the point of investment, and sometimes we do that. And as a result of helping create new markets, we will continue to bring in private capital. Um, so that's how we are planning to do it and doing it in, in all our deals at the moment. Thank you. Um... We have questions from the, the other commissioners, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring them in in turn. Cecilia, you had a, a question or a comment? Well, I just a comment. I agree that I think the, the access to job is an issue, especially when uh, recently we, we were in the Infrastructure Commission to discuss a lot is, is it's absolutely right, it's an intercity as much as an intracity. So we're increasing with the hybrid working, where actually increasing people will move further out. So actually the intercity connection with the intercity is as important. And also it's the type of jobs. We talk about the middle class, they can afford to drive everywhere. But if you look at the type of job, for example, in Manchester, the working class job in the warehouse and the manufacturing, they're actually in the airport or they're in other peripheral urban locations. They're not in the city center. But the whole infrastructure investment so far has been radio from other area in the city region, <coughs> go into city center. And it's not like London, London is web-based. So that means the permeability, accessibility to job is much stronger than the investment in other cities, metropolitan city tend to be radio rather than web-like. So that is the problem when we talk about public investment, it's actually the investment, are they invest in a sensible way an effective way and optimize the accessibility? Um, in a way, if we don't think about the spatial form, how the money is being spent, so it's actually quite difficult to, to, to measure the outcome and whether you know, we're talking something in very crude terms rather than in reality, does it really support the economy? So that I have to go back to bottom up and I agree with that rather than top down. Okay, I think we're going to come back to public infrastructure investment later. So I'm going to let this go for now. Tony, you have a question coming. Yeah, if, if I can follow up with Dovashi on, on, on crowding in, I mean, this is really, really important. Yes. Um, so I can see that you do things to promote crowding in. Yeah. But when it comes to actually making the choices, you know, you can do something here or you can do something <laughs> there, and you want to do the one that generates the most crowding in, how do you plausibly get hold of any sort of sense of? Yeah. What, what's going to work? I mean, what will. So, so how do you do that? Uh, yeah, very, very, you, you really want to know. very good question. We are still a, a bank that is less than two years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are we are just about getting to full contingent. Yes. And so we are very much in learning mode. Mm -hmm. You know, we've done mm -hmm. 15 deals so far. Um, and with every deal, we are learning. And we, we are doing these deals across the span of the five sectors. Uh, and within those sectors, some quite you know, unique segments that you know, other people that may not have done much on. So we, we are not at, the, at a place where we are really making those sorts of choices, but you're right. There will be a time soon where we will have to. So, you know, we published, um, my team led on this, we published our impact framework um, last last week, which sort of gives you how we are thinking about, uh, you know, the theory of change or the pathway to impact and how we would achieve that. So the aspiration is that if we do our job right and we test that pathway through, you know, through the deals and at portfolio level, there will be a, you know, there will be a time when we will start to get get a feel for where we are managing to crowd in more mm. or less. Mm. But right now we are looking at, you know, every deal is, is basically on a case by case basis yeah. and saying, you know, mm. how is this particular investment situated in the sectoral context? We've done a lot of sector analysis as well around some of, some of our sectors. The initial deals were a lot in the digital space. So we've learned a lot from, you know, 
uh, the, the, the world of fiber and, and, and broadband. Um, and now we're moving into clean energy. So, you know, the short answer is we, we just have to learn. We, we have some benchmarks. I mean, government has some benchmarks about, you know, for every pound that public investment makes, you know, what kind of returns you get. Um, and the Treasury has also set us a return to equity ratio um, target. So we have some of those benchmarks at portfolio level that we always keep an eye on. Yeah. But that's, yeah, that's, where, we're, yeah, that's yeah. where we are at at the moment. Yeah. I can't give you any precise, like, this is what we're doing. I just wonder if someone's got some sort of wishful thinking and being, being told stories by the private sector about what they were all doing. Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, which might not be credible. I'm beginning to worry about the amount of time I'm taking. But uh, we have to move on. Before I, before I ask my last question, but, uh, did, there was some questions from Paul. From, from, from me. Yeah, I, I just want to know if anybody has thought about gaps in terms of composition of investment, because we tend to talk about very large transformative projects, infrastructure projects, energy, which strikes me there must be a need also for lots of smaller scale projects. And I wonder whether or not, you know, is there anything to say about that composition of the public investment spectrum rather than just focus on the big end? Uh, we. We told every region to do this um, three years ago. We told every region to come up with a local industrial strategy that was designed to do exactly this. Andy Zappin, I must be right. Um, but to, to our head, Andy's, Andy's always up. So uh, we, told, we told every region to, to, not just, to not just do that, but to, ident to identify the gaps, to identify gaps in supply chains where we're still importing stuff halfway around the world. You know. We could get onto batteries, but that's not for the moment. Um, but we, we told every region to do this, and then we kind of said, "Yeah, we're not interested in that anymore." But every region has every region has an answer to that question, which is, "We want to do X, Y, and Z. This is what we've got. This is what we're missing. This is what we can prime." Every every certainly every MCA. I, I'm not going to go necessarily below that, but every MCA has an answer to that question, which one could give to very clever people like Tony and ask them to sense test it, but, but they've at least got a, an initial answer. Thank you. I am going to ask my last question now. It's, it's to Gerald. We, um, Yanis told us we need something like 2 to 3% of GDP additional investment for the green transition to 2030, and even more than that in the future. How, how much public investment uh, to enable the green transition do you, do you think we need? Is that the right sort of ballpark or even more than that? I, I can't imagine that it would be less, but um, <laughs> I, I don't have the means to, to improve the estimate, I'm afraid. Uh, it, 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 I think one of the issues is that it can't be simply a case of large transformative investments. There has to be, um, we have to somehow incentivize um, the the anxiety to do this at every level of, of business, including small businesses. So at the moment, just wouldn't even think of this as a as a, as a consideration. And um, it, unless we are ready to use um, the tax transfer system quite aggressively to to, to incentivize um, the kind of changes we think we need, um, then we won't permeate the whole system with this kind of change of behavior and then just having a few big transformative um, <coughs> projects might, not, might well not be enough. So it's important that at every level this happens. Exactly. So I was going to ask a follow-up of how close are we in the UK at the minute to, to getting there and I suspect you're, from what you just said the answer is a million miles away. Yeah, I mean, I've been looking particularly at a relatively, um, I wouldn't say backward, but you know, less prosperous part of the country, and it may well be that awareness would be lower in such circumstances that it would be in the, in the Golden Triangle, as we say. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's my impression, certainly. There isn't a right to do it. It's someone else's problem, or it's a problem for the future. Thank you. Uh, we may well come back to this, but uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to hand over to Gillian. I've got Chris. Chris has got his hand up. So maybe Chris first, and then I'm just going to hand straight over to Gillian. Chris, you're on mute. 
so it always happens. I'm a crispy series from the LSE. Um, I, I, it's good time actually that, that you um, allow me to speak because I want to follow up on the investment that is needed for the green transition because a couple of days ago I was at a, a conference mainly of business economists and there, were, um, there was a discussion on the green transition and um, they were saying that they basically have the incentives to uh, invest in the green transition um, you know, basically destroying the planet. They've been persuaded, avoid avoid the destruction of the planet. But but the money wasn't there, and, and all the discussion was uh, where are we going to find the capital to invest all this money that is needed? Which which really surprised me because the view I've always taken, as uh, at least uh, wearing my labor economics hat, is that. When money is needed, we always discover it. I mean, even in the Great Depression, we discovered all the money that was needed to build the whole of North London in two or three years. And uh, what the real constraints are is, is labor. You know, like the green, the green transition is, is a very labor intensive process. And, um, and that labor is mainly manual labor, uh, you know, to put photovoltaics on roofs and pick up holes to put cables inside and all that. And, and the labor are just aren't there. But no one was persuaded by that. We all insisted that what we are short of is capital. I mean, I listened to Ben Bernanke and Larry Summers and people that are saying there's a savings glut. We don't know where to put our savings. That's why we have financial crisis. What do you think? Anyone want to take that? Every, every conversation comes back to steel. Yeah. Yeah. Every conversation in this space comes back to steel. Yeah. Yeah. Did you also come in there? Yeah. Uh, well, maybe I can just uh, make a few comments on that. Um, I think in our modeling of, uh, of meeting the 2050 uh, 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 decarbonization, uh, what we find in our models is that, uh, first of all, the, there will have to be a switch from brown investment to green investment. So there would be a disinvestment in, in the dirty sectors. Uh, uh, and, and that should then hopefully create some capital for new green investments. But on the whole, there is a cost to decarbonization. That would be, uh, uh, we find in our models, there's a decline in consumption because there is a, uh, uh, a, a negative impact. Um, we have to pay for this in terms of our, our welfare costs in paying for the additional investment that's needed for the, for the green sector. I think you're absolutely right when you say that also uh, frictions and uh, bottlenecks in terms of skills. Um, it's very difficult to, to, uh, to train at high speed uh, the sort of workers that we need for this green transition. You need uh, boiler repair it has to have to become uh, installers of, of heat pumps. Uh, solar uh, technicians. Uh, this all requires different skills. And a lot of emphasis should also then go again on to uh, upskilling the labor force to meet these targets. So I think there are two aspects here. Um, this investment in the dirty sectors, in the brown sectors, which of course also means stranded assets in these sectors at a high cost, and uh, investing into upskilling the labor force to make it suitable. Thanks. Yeah, I'm now going to hand over to Gillian Bristow, who's going to lead on the next set of questions. Thanks very much. Yeah, so, so my questions um, really focus more on the sectors and regions. And we sort of touched upon some issues here already with, for example, the emphasis upon the green transition and so on. But perhaps as an opening question, and maybe I'll, I'll put this to, to Nigel to, to start with, um, which regions and sectors do you think are a priority for public investment in terms of increasing the UK's productivity performance? So this is this is kind of the one area where I'd start sounding a little bit like a neoclassical economist. Um, <laughs> you, know, you start off by saying, okay, so what's the market failure here? Um, and and the market failure in this area, quite simply, is and I have half a feeling you might have actually been the editor for this paper that I'm now going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> A paper that we have forthcoming talks about the fact that you know, we've got relatively low levels of unemployment, but we have 
whole sectors of the economy that are basically trapped in a low skill, low productivity equilibrium. And, and if that's the market failure, then public investment should be designed to address that. When we get on to, so, so that's basically everywhere that you can describe as that, which is essentially everywhere outside the golden triangle, really. Um, certainly a high, high proportions of the, the Midlands in Europe. The scale on this, look at Germany. You know, look at the, the extent to which the public investment into Germany has gone into helping the East catch up with the West over the last 30 years. Best estimates are kind of a trillion euro. Mm. And there's still, I mean, I was just actually looking, you know, there are some East, there are some former Eastern European cities whose productivity is well ahead of some of our cities, but they're still kind of a long way behind the leading German ones. Um, and that's that's what we need to be thinking about. You know, it's it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's Leeds, Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, Swansea. It's it's everywhere. Thanks, Nigel. And um, Jerry, would you like to comment on this as well? Yeah, it, I think it is quite difficult to to accept this, but I, what I do think is important is is consistency of policy. You know, we have, even on a micro level, we have policies that say we're going to encourage insulation of houses. So we will, we produce a upward <coughs> scheme in Wales, for example, but at other, at other places too. You introduce a scheme, small companies, small contractors hire people, train them in, in handling possibly toxic materials, and, and, and build capacity to meet a potentially enormous demand for insulation of housing. And then the scheme runs out of money, or it's, or it's, the, uh, it's the victim of, a, of an economy drive, and the demand disappears because it's not subsidized anymore. You weren't going to get that contractor to do it again. You know, he's been caught once, and why would he do it again? And the same applies to solar panels. I mean, we had lots of small companies springing up to supply, to supply your solar panels. Now they spend all their time ringing me up, demanding to know if they can come and maintain my solar panels because the demand for new ones has disappeared. And if you're trying to increase capacity, particularly among smaller companies, you do need a stability of policy. If you keep chopping and changing, you undermine your ability to do anything in the future. And I think we have been guilty of that. So um, I don't know which sector you should be encouraging, but I do think whatever it is, you stick with it. Yeah, so that, that long-termism in public investment is a, is a key principle, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I see Cecilia's put an interesting comment on, on the chat about recognising, going back to the spatial issues, that it's not just regional, interregional, it's intra-regional as well. And I think that's a, clearly an important challenge to, to emphasise here. Um, I, I might move on, though, quickly then to looking in particular at the role that venture capital plays. And um, again, I might, might start with you, Jerry, on this one, uh, given your finance background in particular. So just to, to get your perspective on, on the role that the growth of venture capital has played and in maybe entrenching, embedding and extending the advantages of London and the, and the greater Southeast in the inequalities that we see in the UK's productivity landscape. Yeah, I think there's a huge issue around venture capital, and I can be quite lucid in setting out what it is, and much less lucid in saying what to do about it. <laughs> <laughs> the, trouble, the trouble with venture capital is that it's regarded, and it is, a high-risk activity, and so to get money into it, if I'm a venture capitalist and I want to attract wealth owners to invest in my venture fund, I've got to offer them 25%. They know and I know that I'm not going to make that. I'm going to make them 15 on a good on a good year. But if I don't offer them 25, they're not coming in. So you have extremely high expected rates of return, which the venture capitalists then try and try and extract, which means they are not patient capitalists on the whole. They're looking for a five-year um, exit uh, so they can realize those returns. And so venture capital in the UK at least isn't necessarily patient capital. 
It's venturesome capital, but it's not patient capital. Now, the only way to solve that is to have very big units, because if I've got, you know, a thousand activities and one or two of them make a thousand percent, I can be patient with everybody else. But of course, if I have if that, because that raises administrative issues. If I'm a huge, huge organization, do I have the footprint in different places to be looking for relatively small deals and regional opportunities? I mean, the experience is no. The venture capital industry in this country has retreated from the regions. They used to be represented in Cardiff, they no longer are. Um, and so there's been a retreat. There's been a um, tendency to focus on big, easy deals and, and the hard work of actually finding the nuggets you know, in the uh, mire or whatever um, tends, tends to go by default. Um, so I think there's how you organize it so that you can realize the, the scale necessary while also retaining the particularity of, of finding initially small deals and how you can, um, can support the industry without it, it being too exacting on the people that it's, that it's, that it's eventually with that are very difficult questions. And, um, so far, the, the public sector uh, hasn't really managed to find a way to fill that gap or to, or to incentivize venture capitalists to behave ideally. Um, uh, the, the, um, uh, there are more things to say about that, but, but I, mean, I, I can give you one example of the public sector getting it wrong. Um, the British Business Bank uh, has various um, Sort of venture fund, and it's it's been told to to focus on companies less than seven years old, because that's where the fast growth occurs in the first seven years. How do we know? Because American research has shown it. So if you publish that in the AER, it's got to be true. Maybe it'll be in the Bible. <laughs> the trouble is, in a place like Wales, right? There are it's not being prowled by aggressive venture capitalists looking for good companies. And if I've got a good idea and I start a company off, I don't have the redundancy to be in it. I'm flat out doing, doing what I'm doing, applying my, my edge in, in the particular niche I have. As the company gets bigger, uh, I may then be able to take on more management, get more management bandwidth, start running it efficiently and creating the redundancy to actually innovate further. And what we found was, all of the good companies, the ones with really good um, uh, growth potential, were more than 10 years old. So the, in, in the UK, in a backward area, the, optimal, the high speed period of growth is not the first seven years, it's the second seven years. And here's the British Business Bank refusing to invest in those companies because they're more than seven years old. You know, we're not living in New York. Somebody should tell them. <laughs> Thanks very much. I wonder whether any of the other witnesses would like to come in on, on this particular issue around, around venture capital and the role that it plays. I'm, I'm sorry to be flippant. I mean, I, I do think there's a role for the public sector, uh, either with a development bank or something of that sort, to try and help to fill this space, um, possibly in, in collaboration with existing venture capitalists. It's just that I observe that it's not well done at the moment, and I don't really know exactly how it to work, but we do need to think about that. Thank you. I mean, this, this probably is a nice segue into uh, a related question, really, which is about this sort of, when we've touched on it a little bit already, the relationship between the public sector and private sector investment. Mm. And I wonder if, if, if you might all each witness kind of comment on the role of um, sort of the increasing, enhancing business investment to the supply side of the economy, which appears to have, have stalled. How can, what can public sector investment do to sort of encourage, incite and grow that, that business investment? Um, perhaps, perhaps, Jan, I don't know whether you might like to, to start with, with this one. Yeah. Um... I think what we uh, try to do, and again, I want to make the parallel here to the European RRF, the Recovery and Resilience Facility. Um, total of the funding there goes to, again, uh, the energy infrastructure, 
where we think the, the, the greatest needs are. Uh, thinking in terms of um, uh, supporting uh, interconnectivity of uh, energy systems across countries, but also things like um, uh, EV chargers, uh, setting up a better network of EV chargers, where, which we think is the biggest bottleneck in um, for people to adopt an uh, electric vehicle. Um, by doing that sort of investment, I think public investment can stimulate private investment in supporting uh, car industry to move faster in moving to uh, to uh, EVs. Um, I think there's also looking at what the US is doing in, in the IRA, in the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, they are very much focusing on tax credits, um, trying to give tax credits to industry to promote this green transition. And uh, I think that's another channel through which the government can can, can speed up the, uh, the move to uh, decarbonization. Uh, they have an enormous uh, fund available, 350, 400 billion US dollars for this. Um, and I think it's very important. And of course, in Europe, we are getting very worried about uh, the international competitiveness of our economies vis-a-vis -vis the US, in that we, are, we may not have the fiscal space to give the same uh, scale of subsidies as the US can do, but um, I think this is the, the the biggest challenge for for the EU and I think also for the UK probably. Thank you, um, Avashi. I wonder whether you wanted to to come in here. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think you know just uh, agreeing with uh, with Jan actually because a lot of um, what uh, UK Infrastructure Bank is focused on uh, and will be in 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 the future. Um, will be on energy in infrastructure, well, uh, clean energy investments, as well as transport and um, water and waste and uh, digital, but predominantly, I would say clean energy and transport, because we know that that will drive down a lot of the, um, or, you know, help achieve the net zero transition. Uh, and that will span from uh, generation to storage, so that the grid, uh, you know, the grid works, um, electrification of transport, both at an you know EV charging level, but also in in, in uh, local areas. Um, and <clears throat> what what we are doing is basically we are in very simple terms between the market and government. So we sit. So if you if you've seen the green finance strategy, there, there was there's a nice diagram which kind of maps where all the institutions are, mm -hmm. you know, on the uh, technology and the financial maturity curve. So we are in, in between and so we can take more risk than, you know, commercial banks, because we are still very much in the business of correcting market failures, shaping, shaping and creating new markets. Um, so we, we can take more risk. We are flexible. We don't have a fixed way of doing things. So, you know, we want to get a return, but we can do equity where there is, you know, high risk, uh, long, longer payback um, and loans and guarantees. And um, we're also in the business of partnering with investors. So we, you know, and I think by doing all those things, we get a very unique lens into where we can stimulate and bring in private sector investment. What is very clear from, you know, from a sort of uh, an objective economic perspective is that in this space, we can't do it alone. So it's really important to, going back to the whole crowding in point, it's really important to, uh, have a very clear, be clear eyed about you know the private sector, and often the private sector is waiting to see where the public sector is going. You know, where's that regulation? Where's that standard? Where where's the policy framework? Um, and and we are very closely aligned with with the government departments like Desnes and Gila. So we have to be quite docked into that. But we are playing an influencing role on that end as well to say, look, we offer a unique insight into the market, into the commercial banks, into the you know private investment space, and this is what we are seeing. Uh, 
And in some instances, there is coordination failure. And you know, then we go back and speak to the speak to the government departments. So, you know, again, I mean, I'm I'm giving you a very delivery focused perspective, not a theoretical one, but that is that is how we are going to have to do this, you know, in uh, in, in the net zero space at least. Thank you, Ashley. Jimmy, if I may, uh, Bart wants to come in and ask the next question. If that's okay, would you just bring it in yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, so I want to pick up because I think it's relevant for the sector and for the region discussion on the research and development that we briefly touched upon a little early because that discussion around where to go with R&D is, is a rather muddled one. There are different models here and I don't think that's a clear course. I'd like to hear from maybe all four panelists, but maybe some of you want to take the lead, how we have to think about it. And basically there are two models. One model is a sort of act equity model of R&D. This is where the 4 billion uh, model that Richard Jones was describing is coming from. So if you're saying we need to have an equal amount of R&D everywhere in the UK, pretty much, you know, which means that uh, London will have less and the rest of the country will be more. So that there's another model that would say, well, outside London, uh, take, take, take the average of this. Now, from, from an economist point of view, that's a pretty crazy model, <clears throat> to be honest. I mean, that, that is just a huge amount of inefficiency, but there are people out there who say, look, you know, sometimes you have to put the R&D in front. It's sort of the horse in front of the cart and it could attract uh, other investments. So you have to make choices here. So maybe you don't do it everywhere, but you do it definitely in some critical places outside London where you do this. The other model is basically a high return model. That's what the economists would go for and say, look, there are agglomeration effects. So, so put R&D there where you can have these large agglomeration effects, which is basically if you put your public R&D where you think our private R&D can be crowded in, or perhaps already is, um, and you can have even a more sector-focused model on this as well. So I'd like, perhaps, I'm not sure if all four of you want to answer this, but hopefully one or two of you will pick up a little bit. How are we going to think about this? Because on the one hand, you hear this story there, you know, we need to spread R&D around, and it's, as I said, from an economic point of view, not quite right, but I understand that technology people might say that might work. Whereas from an economic point of view, you might choose much more for a high return model, which means that we may pick a few places outside London, because it's probably in London in the southeast, but certainly we have to think much more from putting it where it already is, and we get even more of it. I'll go first if you like. <laughs> Somebody coming from an R&D sort of region. Yes, yeah. so, so I think if we, if we kind of abstract a little bit from from Richard Jones and say what he was what 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 one could conversely argue is that there is already a market failure in the allocation of R&D that, that in quotes too much of it is allocated to safe bet you know that an application for funding from a certain institution is more likely to be funded than an application from another institution even if the quality of the science is the same, which is essentially not saying we just need to spread it around, it's saying we need to be aware of, if you like, the potential market failure that's already existed. Um, af after that, I think then, and, and this, this comes back to the questions I think that, that Jill were, was asking as well, is if you want to make a case, if a region, a location, wants to make a case for more investment on the grounds of additionality rather than just better science. I'm often against better science, but if, if we're in the realms of making a case on the basis of additionality, then the location needs to make that case. And the location needs to make that case oh, along the line of the, the questions that Jill asked about. Okay, so, so what are we missing here? What will this technology enable? You know, so let's let's do batteries for a minute because it's easy. If we have more investment in battery technology in a given location, what does that enable? Well, it doesn't just enable more R and D into batteries because if it, if that if that finds its way into the market, it enables more an expansion of plastic moldings because whatever it is you put a battery in, it needs a plastic molding wrap. It you know so it. it so it's so the, the question then for the region is right. So what have you got? Is is the way I would answer it, which is kind of halfway in between. Mm -hmm. Now the issue then is what do you do when a when a location, not a region, when a location looks straight back at you and actually we've got nothing. 
you know, I'm not going to, we can all think of locations that might, I'm not going to name them now, but you know, what do you do if, if somewhere just says actually, you know, no, we don't have anything, we just want the case for some investment because we need some investment. And, and that's where kind of where I would draw the line. I would say there are many places where funding for R&D can be absolutely an enabling technology for all of the, the transitions and all of the things that we talked about, but the region then has to make that case, which brings us back to the industrial strategies that everybody wrote four or five years ago that got abandoned. That's my kind of hybrid answer. Uh, I, I very substantially agree with that. I mean, you, you can build a house, but uh, you know, it's going to be some rock and put it on, you can't put it on sand. So I think, I think it is the case that if you look for areas that have a particular <coughs> specialization and you say, well, they have got some of the, the ancillary or, 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 or supportive elements that might mean this thing could, could take off, it could learn from the practitioners and the practitioners can employ the results so i think you, you do need to do that and if if there is no such uh, there's no such basis then you've got to find another way out and r d isn't the way but but maybe uh, or actually maybe you can ask the question it comes back to the crowd in because i think what both of you are yeah. saying as well there's an additionality component so product r d follows by or at least a base on the bits of base of which you can build public r and Now, if you think about, you know, the crowding in effects, you want to put the horse in front of the car. You basically say, let's put public r and there because we see the potential to actually crowd in the private r and and the private development. So, you know... That's what I said. Hmm? I think that's what I said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what is the potential? What could that potential consist of? Except the fact that there's some activity in the area which is either of benefit to the research or will benefit from the research. If, if there's no such activity, what is that potential? Can I, can I just, uh, and this is just my own view, not, not something you know necessarily linked to the bank, but we need to perhaps unpack what we mean by R&D. Now we know that you know, part of a productivity puzzle is more about the fact that perhaps 95% of the businesses in this country struggle with commercialization and exploitation of R&D. And we do very well in the sciences. We put a lot of money you know, there and we get very good returns. <clears throat> but as soon as it goes you know, from the left to the right of the S curve or whatever you call it, we start to see that that, you know, it's, um, it's not being realized. I think Van Rienen and others did a big piece of work showing the intangibles and uh, how, you know, a, a small group of sectors and companies are veering away from the rest of the economy. So I think it's not just about looking at the input, it's the quality of the input. And then going back to what you said, it's then saying, well, you know, in certain sectors and certain regions, those barriers are more acute, you know, and that's where we are going to target them. There is a question of, you know, equity on R&D input. There is a leveling up mission on, you know, on, on R&D expenditure. But there, there is that bigger part of the puzzle, productivity puzzle, which is, you know, how do we resolve uh, you know, the fact that the, the full returns of exploiting the benefits of R&D need to go above and beyond <laughs> initial science and research. It also depends on, how, on whether we're trying to concentrate R&D and are we trying to pick winners in, in an intellectual sense. Um, if you decided that you were going to do an awful lot of research into uh, Agriculture, for example, how to get the best out of upland, you know, grasslands or something. I mean, you'd probably put the research in Cumberland, which you wouldn't, because you wouldn't put the research in Cumberland. <laughs> so I think it, it also depends on how, how granular we, we are we're being with our R&D support. Are we selecting yeah. fashionable sectors or are we looking across the piece and saying anybody who's got a, a, a potentially profitable um, line of activity, if they can produce an argument that they need a, they need research support to really take off, we'll consider it. I mean, I think 
that comes into it as well. The more, the broader your R and D effort, I mean, the broader you can spread it. Should move on, but Julian, is there anything that you want to come back on? Or no, I, just, I was just going to say, I think Jan has his hand raised, and then I suggest yeah. you know, perhaps we move on to the next section. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Can I just add one one uh, additional aspect to this? Uh, I think what is important for in, in our models is uh, the link with the skill structure. Um, I think it makes little sense uh, in, in our models to uh, give a wage subsidy to R&D or the tax credit for R&D in a country that has uh, a shortage of high skilled workers. Then you all you're doing is you drive up wages and um, and the, the, there's no additional productivity effect coming from this. So I think it also very much depends on labor mobility. Uh, it may be higher among high, high skilled workers, but it's still probably a, a restricting factor in how you allocate your R&D uh, support. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I think it's uh, now time to pass the baton on to Alan for the next set of questions. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> hey, thanks, uh, Gillian. So I'll uh, get moving. I think I'm starting a bit later, so I might have slightly less time, uh, but that, that's okay. And a certain number of the issues have been uh, covered. So just to give you a, a, a small bit of background on sort of where, where I come from uh, or come at this issue, uh, and you'll understand being from Ireland, uh, the sort of investment in public infrastructure gets a very good press, let me put it like that. Okay, so again, most of you will probably be familiar uh, with the extent to which Ireland experienced a, an economic transformation of sorts in the 1990s. And when people write about this period, one of the items that always gets listed uh, as part of the, the success was investment in public infrastructure, a lot of which was driven by European Union structural and cohesion funds at the time. Uh, so again, for people who have visited Ireland before and afterwards, you know, remarkable sort of improvement in the, the road infrastructure, water infrastructure, wastewater, and you know, all those, the sort of dimensions. Uh, so we have a sort of a sense here in Ireland that this was a, uh, you know, a, a very positive development, but of course a whole load of other things were going on at the same time. And it's always impossible to sort of disentangle uh, precisely uh, uh, the, the effect of public uh, infrastructure. But when colleagues from be it Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales in particular come over uh, to Dublin to discuss the issues of economics developments, these are always some of the issues that they're always really sort of keenly interested in. Uh, and as a result, uh, I sort of maintain a, a, a strong interest in it. But th the first question I want to come to, uh, Urvashi, if you wouldn't mind if I could just ask you a, a, a couple more questions, and it's a bit more about the uh, the, the micro details uh, of, of the infrastructure bank. And one of the things I'm really interested in is what role do you play relative to the government departments that traditionally did big infrastructure expenditure? Okay, so I presume there was some reason that you were set up in 2021. There was some deficiency in the existing systems that was identified. And I'm just curious to learn a little bit more about what, what were those deficiencies and, and basically what, what problem were you created to solve? So, um, you know, I think a lot of, you know, I think it was the Treasury that had published um, a report on um, investments in infrastructure, um, infrastructure financing in particular. Uh, and we have to distinguish between funding and financing here. A lot of the financing historically, especially on um, energy utilities, has been happening alongside the private sector. So it's, you know, so I think when um, the bank was first being, you know, thought about, it was to address, I mean, clearly the fact that the level and the scale of private investment in net zero transition mm. is going to be massive and that needs to be scaled up. So that's why that's one of our missions. And then making sure that, you know, the benefits of that are spread across the UK, which is why we've got the local and uh, regional economic growth mission. So it, it, it's mainly designed to address and stimulate private sector investment in, um, in financing of, you know, of infrastructure, not necessarily funding. So we are not, for example, they're here to replace the bank is not here to replace any subsidies or grants. You know, there are various grant schemes that DESNES is currently running on, uh, you know, on clean energy. 
heat networks, hydrogen, CCUS. I, what we see is we are there to do after that. So when, as I was saying, you know, we are in we are in between that, you know, government initially coming in and helping with prototyping, you know, taking some of the very initial risk in infrastructure technologies. And we come in then where there's still some appetite from the private sector, but there's still a lot of risk. And we are able to take that risk and bring the private sector in. And that's the bit that we are, uh, the sweet spot that we are, you know, we, we are meant to address effectively. Okay. No, I think one of the reasons I'm kind of interested in as an issue is that I know we're talking about infrastructure expenditure, okay, and asking the question, you know, about its value. But of course, infrastructure, public infrastructure is one of those areas where you can have really good public infrastructure expenditures and remarkably wasteful uh, <laughs> expenditures as well. And again, I mean, again, the phrase like, you know, white elephants and stuff like that, uh, you know, th this is just a vanity projects is another issue that comes up continually. And I'm just wondering in terms of your sort of investment appraisal, uh, I yeah. mean, d d does the treasury apply to you the same sort of investment appraisals that it would apply to government departments? Or do you have a, a, a different sort of appraisal mechanism? And it goes to that issue of the extent to which, uh, you know, th this is an area where, where an awful lot of money can actually be wasted. So, so first of all, we, the bank is operationally independent. It's owned by the Treasury. Treasury is our shareholder. And it sets the mandate. It tells us, here's, here's your, you know, here are your priority sectors. But it does not dictate how we, you know, how we would exactly operationalize everything, including how we run our investment appraisals. We of course have to align to the green book and the magenta book and everything else. So um, I lead on the investment appraisals, the, the, the economic appraisals of the, of the investments. And, uh, you know, so the impact framework that I mentioned earlier basically gives you gives you the framing of how we are thinking about those, those investments. And we have, what, what, what we have tried to do is, you know, take the best out of, you know, the Green Brook uh, way of appraising, um, but not necessarily ignore, you know, what the other public finance institutions are doing. So we've been talking to all of them, UKEF, you know, uh, BBB, um, um, Scottish National Investment Bank, Welsh Development Banks in Northern, you know, Northern Ireland, and international PFIs as well, and uh, international, you know, public finance institutions. So we we have the beauty of starting from a clean slate in many ways, mm -hmm. and not restricting ourselves necessarily, whilst being true to, you know, how we test for value for money for the taxpayer. So we take a robust approach. We test for additionality. We we pay, uh, we have an additionality approach which is published as well. You can have a look, and it essentially rates every invest you know every investment. So we judge, but it's not a precise science. And we 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 uh, we don't rate impact, but we give our judgment on you know the impact potential for each of the investments, and we take account of you know what's happening in the wider sectoral and regional context as well. So we are not doing a classic benefit cost uh, assessment, mainly because we you know we are expecting a positive financial return on every every investment, but we are careful about you know, what benefits, net benefits are being generated from uh, from the investments. So we, yep. we spent the first year learning from what others are doing, which is, I think, a, a, a real addition to how we, how we um, appraise our investments. OK, I, I want to get my sort of second uh, sort of block of, of, of questions uh, in. But if any of the other panelists want to sort of comment on that issue of the sort of quality of decision making in the public sector around um, public investment, uh, be happy to hear the thoughts. But my, my, my second set of, or sort of questions and this Ger Gerald and Nigel in the first instance, and maybe Jan can comment on it. Um, very often in Ireland, the way we've thought about public infrastructure is not so much the direct effect on the productivity of existing firms, but it's been around uh, creating an environment where foreign direct investment is going to happen. 
Okay, so it's a bit like, you know, the field of dreams argument, if you build it, they will come. And at one level, that's about having better road network and transport networks and, and, you know, those sort of things. But it's a bit more than that. It's also like having sort of good hospitals, good schools. It's, it's building an infrastructure. So you're creating a, a place that is essentially a nice place to live. And by extension, the sort of place where uh, firms may want to invest, again, subject to all the other issues around availability of human capital. So I, I'd like to get your thoughts on, on, on whether or not that, that, that sort of thinking is, is present in, in the UK around public you know, infrastructural investment. It's about creating nice places. And in that context, can people talk for a moment about whether or not housing should be part of public investment to a greater extent. Uh, again, reading about the UK from a distance, housing seems to be a real constraint uh, in, in a whole range of areas. Uh, so is, is it the case that, you know, the public authorities got out of house building to a certain extent, but they may need to go back into that, uh, again, to sort of create more viable uh, centres uh, beyond London. So maybe, Gerald, if I can throw that one to you, uh, and, and maybe Nigel will come in, and I'll sort of reformulate the, the, the question for Jan in a, in a moment. Well, I think people are certainly aware of the argument that um, who was the, again, in Ann Arbor, I think, who first broached this, but they're certainly aware of the argument that uh, people are more likely to set up in nice places than in nasty places. I think it depends quite a lot, though, on, on the nature of the business. Um, if, it's, uh, if you're going to move your sort of front office there, then um, you probably worry about those things. If you're moving a back office or an assembly plant, then you probably worry rather less. Uh, so, um, and I don't know that there's very much happening uh, uh, on the policy front, though I stand to be corrected, to actually address that as an as a, an element of of development policy. People seem to be aware of the argument, but not to be doing a great deal about it. Um, I don't know. If anybody has even tried to calculate the, you know, the potential return to providing a lot of luxury homes or more parks or whatever. Um, it's, um, so I, I think it's more talked about than, than actually followed, if you turn. Um, okay. And Nigel, any, any thoughts on it and specifically on the housing issue then? So, um, so it feels like a lifetime ago, but when Manchester did its independent economic review, we did the end with investment piece for that, and Diane, one of our colleagues, was kind of the lead of that overall project. And, and we highlighted exactly all of those issues. You know, that if you, particularly if you want to attract skilled, skilled and high paid labor, you need to have not just have, not just a nice house for them to live in, you also have a nice and decent school for them to send their kids to. You know, that the, there's all sorts of aspects of, public infrastructure that, that contribute to that. I mean, one of the reasons why I live where I do is because not only do we have a relatively nice house, but we also have uh, half a mile's walk from a nice school, you know, and I can get to work on my bike and so on and so on. So there's, there's all sorts of things that, it, that influence individual location decisions, which in turn influence firm location decisions. Um, we, we published a paper um, last year, which I still is the best referee's comment I've ever had, which was from a, an, Amer an American reviewer who just said, I'm not reviewing this socialist nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> and because uh, what we were showing, <laughs> what, what we were showing, it was a, a business school academic. I happen to know who it I, I made an effort to find out who it was. So. <laughs> um, but but one of the things that we we argue and we show in in that paper is that things like welfare spending matters. <laughs> You know, that, that firms actually don't want a race to the bottom, you know, because if you want, if you want to persuade highly skilled people, then they, they're interested in welfare spending. Welfare spending makes labour markets work. You know, you're more likely to take a risk in the labour market if it doesn't pay off, if you know that there's a safety net. Welfare spending matters because somebody has to be looking after your old parents while you're at work, whatever it is. So there are all sorts of aspects of of public sector spending that, that go into that. Now, housing provision, uh, we don't have long enough to talk about the utter insanity that is the UK housing market. Uh, but I'll, other than to say 
So my dad is 91 and all his friends are obsessed by two things, that, that the value of their house keeps on going up and how outrageous it is that their grandchildren can't buy a house. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just just to bring Jan in on that very very quickly. I mean, in, in terms of modelling, um, and again from a European perspective, I mean, for so long, cohesion funds and cohe structural funds were all about that sort of notion of Im Im improving productivity capacity or whatever like that, uh, where people were, but also that attraction of of, of new investment. And I'm wondering, is, is that sort of thinking informing the modelling? And is it actually being observed then in terms of outcomes? Yeah, I think um, I mean you raised an interesting example. You started off saying how successful the EU structural funds have been in Ireland, and of course, uh, yeah, Ireland is a, is really um, a success case for our cohesion funds. But because there are other examples, other countries in the EU that probably have seen some overinvestments um, in public capital. Um, uh, Portugal is often mentioned where. Uh, decades of, of, of structural funds have not done much to to raise uh, TV growth. Um, some people argue there has been too much, uh, as you mentioned, white elephants, too much infrastructure investment maybe uh, in, in, in some regions. It hasn't really had the positive effects. Um, when you talk about um, uh, a direct effect and indirect effect of public infrastructure investments, I think in in our models we base these um, uh, the, the calibration of our models on what's estimated in the macroeconomic regressions, and these regressions would I think pick up that there's not only a direct effect on uh, promoting boosting productivity of of firms, but also uh, indirect effects uh, synergies uh, through. Um, uh, uh, yeah, indirect effects through improving living circumstances, having better transportation, um, and I think these these effects are are, are really captured in the macroeconomic uh, regressions that we base our models on. The other aspect you mentioned is about housing. Um, I don't think I can really judge whether this should be private or publicly funded, but I think certainly, uh, as Nigel says, this is a very important factor in uh, location decisions um, for firms. FDI, but also for domestic firms. So these are certainly uh, uh, housing, housing stock, housing capital stock is uh, equally important, I think, as the infrastructure capital stock. Great. Th thanks a lot. I think I am out of time now, Jack, don't I? Uh, no, we, you, you're pumping up against the, uh, is there something urgently you want well, to ask? Well, I, I, would, I would love to take the opportunity, um, and it's a, it's a question, uh, Director Professor Holcomb, um, and it, it relates to uh, essentially the, the funding of the devolved administrative areas. Uh, and like, here's, my, here's my question. I mean, I, I understand the mechanism whereby through the Barnet formula, money goes to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, but if I look at Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, and again, forgive me for focusing on Northern Ireland, uh, it, it seems to have a sort of an infrastructural deficit, okay, where it, it, it almost needs a sort of a, a, a large transfer of, of cash in a relatively shorter space of time to bring its infrastructure up to where uh, it would ideally need to be. I don't know as, uh, as as much about Wales as, as Scotland. But I would just like to ask Professor Holden, given the work he's done on these issues, like is, is the funding model of the devolved areas constraining what would otherwise be rational public investment? And I ask that partly because uh, concerns I hear expressed in Northern Ireland about the idea, if money is to be spent from London through the levelling up department, the sort of local knowledge and localised needs may not be taken uh, on board in the same way if the decisions were made in, in, in Stormont or uh, wherever else in the devolved areas. Well, I think your suspicion is well founded. Uh, the, um, there has been a tendency to try and re-centralise um, uh, the, uh, the locus of some decision making. Um, and uh, certainly there there's no surplus of investment funds in the devolved areas for, for infrastructure development, nor do the formulae that allocate um, grants to those areas make any specific provision for need of any kind, whether including infrastructure investment. It's clearly formulaic, we spent this much in England, your population is X times or an X from England, you get you get that. Um, yeah, I would simplify a little bit, but not very much. And there's no specific um, 
allocation for 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 need um, uh, for infrastructure or need anything else. Um, so the fact that the fact that you have you know more old people, more sick people, doesn't automatically mean you get more health expenditure. It does in in England uh, within English regions. The, there's a formula which is applied to the National Health Service and it, that dictates that you get more money in Sunderland and less in Berkhamsted if you know they've got more poor people, old people, pregnant people, whatever. But that doesn't apply to the Gulf territories. So there is no such uh, there's no such method. Okay, thanks, uh, Jack. I'll hand over now. Um, I'm not sure who I'll hand over to. You'll have to tell me. No, it'll be to Adrian, but just to say we, we, we've spoken to the witnesses beforehand and, and we can continue this dialogue after the evidence session. A number of questions have been raised that just isn't time uh, to see through fully. So I, I obviously there's an ongoing chance to have a chat with you as we collect our thoughts. Adrian. Thank you uh, very much. So the fourth uh, and final segment is on improving uh, public investment. So in some sense, it, it uh, is perhaps more normative than the, than the previous uh, sections. And I'd like to start with um, the following, I think, simple fundamental question, which is what do you think should be the size of public investment going forward? I'm not yet asking how we're going to get there, but just the size. Is it, roughly speaking, 3% of GDP per year? Or is it, sorry, over, no, sorry, it's not over, it's not per year. It's, you know, I think it's the forecast horizon of the OBR, so <coughs> okay, which then translates into about 80 billion per year. But if we include the green transition, and some are saying that would be an extra two to three percent, does that mean that the, the, the accurate size is closer to five or six percent of GDP? But where, in your view, is the, you know, desirable size of public investment for all the needs that we've discussed. Now who wants to go first? No. Uh, my instinct, sorry. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> um, my answer to this is kind of, if the US stays on the course it's on, then it's a lot more. Um, if the US stays on the course with the, the Inflation Reduction Act, then we have a competitive let, let's we are after all you are after all the productivity commission we have a productivity and competitiveness problem if we don't if we don't do something about that um so whether it's six percent seven percent whatever but if if we are serious not just about the road to net zero <laughs> things like transport and heating but also facilitating investment in the sorts of sectors that can thrive in this new sort of net zero environment, then I think we're talking about significantly more than that. How much I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise we're just going to be, you know, we're just going to be left behind by the big play. Well, um, is there any reason to think that the public sector should systematically have a smaller investment ratio than the private sector? I mean, I can't think of one. So why isn't it spending, if public expenditure is 40 percent, why isn't at least a tenth of that uh, investment? You know, you look, must be looking at four or five percent just for starters. And given the backlog we now have in this country, I mean, you know, you can't get into a court. Um, well, you were closing courts, which is right, but you, know, the, the, you can hardly look at a sector where there isn't a backlog of necessary investment, um, whether it's health, education, whatever you like. So, so if, you, if you're running total should be four five, and you've got a huge backlog. Quite a, before we get on to enormous transformations of the economy and keeping up with international tendencies, I mean, it's clear we're, we're probably halfway to where we should be at best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a difficult question to answer. I don't really pin down uh, an exact number. I think nobody can really do that. But um, I referred <clears throat> earlier to estimates of um, of what what people think is a socially optimal level of of public investment. And as I said, that depends crucially on the productivity of of public capital. And that's why it's important what um, Uvashi was referring to the 
testing for the value of um, the, the value for money when um, when you undertake public investment projects. But um, looking at the the mean estimate in the literature of uh, this productivity. Uh, using that then to calculate an optimal level of public investment, you come to a level which is larger than 3% of GDP. Uh, I think uh, the paper by uh, Valerie Rami finds for the US, it can be something like 3 or 5% of GDP for the US. Now that is still excluding the additional needs that I also referred to earlier of the green transition. Now, if people estimate their uh, two to three percent of GDP per year additional investment, it doesn't mean that's all public investments. A large part of that may have to be private investments, but still uh, a significant share also public investment. So, yeah, I think the ideal public investment share is much larger than we see now in most European economies and and in the UK. Uh, how much more? I don't really can answer that. <laughs> Something I pass on. Thank you. Well, you know, others are much more qualified than me to to give it, give this. Uh, and I agree with uh, Jan that you know I think there is no precise number. But I mean, maybe we need to ask a different question. I mean, in the next two decades, three decades, you know, productivity. It has to translate to living standards and, and, and improving living standards. Um, Resolution Foundation has said that you know, it's, you know the, the, we, are, we are facing the worst in the, you know, since the last 70 years. Maybe we ask a different, you know, we look at it in a different way. I would like the economist community to start looking at that and going beyond growth and productivity. So there you go. That's the question for your next. Session. Well, actually, it, it very much resonates with what we're doing in our outlook, where we Fantastic. you know look at regions and households and say very much that it is about growth and productivity at the service of yeah you know both yeah. reducing inequalities but also making sure that living standards return yeah to pre-COVID levels where you know they're, they're, they're certainly seven eight percent down from from that. Um, can I ask the second uh, question, which is about fiscal frameworks and examples of successful macroeconomic policies <clears throat> to support public investment. So do we think changes are needed to the UK fiscal framework to have more public investment? And if so, what changes? And where are the ex examples of successful macroeconomic policies to boost public investment here, either historically or elsewhere at the moment? We've heard a lot about the Inflation Reduction Act. You know, can we point to other examples? Um, but it's really about both the fiscal framework and macroeconomic policy. So, either in the same order or in another, I don't know whether anyone wants to go yeah, first. first. Okay, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, I think um, in Europe we have uh, at the moment in, um, the um, economic governance review going on, a lot of discussion about the SGP. Um, as I said, we, we recognize that uh, the need for austerity uh, in a way uh, for political and institutional constraints uh, let countries to reduce public investment first because it's easier. Uh, there are not many lobbying groups to support public investment. Um, I think we've recognized now the role for public investment and try to safeguard the role for public investment. Um, by uh, allowing countries in the, the new legislative proposals for the uh, economic governance review, uh, allowing countries more time for their fiscal adjustments if they are seen to undertake the necessary reforms and investments. So by separating investments out from uh, current uh, expenditure and uh, recognizing that uh, there is a special role for public investments. Now, in the UK, I think you have a similar uh, framework where you allow, uh, uh, you, you, you make a special case for public investments, uh, a type of a golden rule for public investment where you don't take it into account into uh, the, the, the direct fiscal framework. I think it's important to, to recognize that and to be aware of that. Um, I think another aspect that we should mention is how is public, public uh, investment financed? Um, I think it's very important to also make sure that uh, if you increase the share of public investment in the economy, that you don't do that through more distortionary taxes, because then 
you may offset the positive growth effects from public investments uh, by uh, uh, the negative uh, impact from, say, higher corporate taxation. So you also must uh, be aware that there is a need to shift the tax burden from distortionary taxes to less distortive taxes like uh, property taxes and, and green taxes. I think those two aspects that I think are important for uh, the larger fiscal context. In, in no particular order, Jerry. You see. Yeah, one area is 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 the way that we handle the, the accounting for the public investment and for borrowing. Um, I mean, why does public debt matter? It matters presumably because it's a potential burden on future taxpayers. So if it isn't a, a burden on future taxpayers, it's a fact that it doesn't matter. And uh, so public investments which are financed through, um, through the sale of the service in the market as, or, or are supposed to be self-financing should not be part of a public sector borrowing requirement. They are not in any other country in, in, in the United Nations, as far as I know. I mean, if SNCF wants to borrow to build a railway line, it is not a part of the French government's fiscal target. Uh, and they issue their own bonds, which may or may not have a state guarantee, and you can always put the put the insurance premium on the on the state's books. You know, but we in this country, we've got this thing called the public sector borrowing requirement, which was originally there because it, people thought if, if we do everything through the guilt market, it's cheaper. If you have railway bonds or mm. or electricity bonds or any other state utility. Um, they'll pay a premium over the central government borrowing. So we'll eliminate that and have it all done through kills, which was great, except that that then became the fiscal talent, which has meant that, you know, we in this country, we like to do things like nationalise railways because they can't get enough finance in the private sector, and then privatise them because they can't get enough finance in the public sector. <laughs> I mean, yeah, uh, um, so I mean, just, uh, just saying, look, we're going to have a rational fiscal target, which depends on on this being financed out of taxes, and if it's not financed out of taxes, it's not part of the fiscal target. And if, if, if public utilities, <coughs> public agencies can borrow, issuing their own bonds and finance them off their own balance sheet, then they can get on with it. I mean, doing the trade. Mm -hmm. I think that would be mm -hmm. at least the help of the margin. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm not a macroeconomist, and I'm I don't really want to speculate on macroeconomics in this building, but <laughs> you're very welcome to do that. Um, but um, I think my, my, my answer to your question of where else, where else can we look at, I look at Korea, that when they decided, okay, we are going to move from being a low skill, low productivity, low innovation economy, and we are going to move this. And, and fiscal policy and industrial policy and export policy, everything just went in the same direction. And everything just went for, okay, if, if you, and whether it was public sector support for R&D, public sector support for inward investors who were going to upskill the local economy, public, public sector support for universities, everything went in the same direction all at once. And hey, presto, they basically, they went from being an emerging economy to being a rich economy in, you know, let's say, 15 years, maybe 20. And, and that's, that's my answer. So you want the UK to adopt a developmental state model? I think if we're going to be serious about moving the dial on both the sectors that we need for net zero, the rebalancing of the economy, whatever that means, the moving huge, huge parts of our economy out of a low skill, low productivity equilibrium. I think, I think that's what it needs. I mean, would I, would I do it if it ever worked? If I was like King of Britain, yes, probably, you know, I can see how it can be done, but it's a whole change from what government does is government puts in incentives and hopes that the private sector then acts appropriately on those incentives. Except that it then withdraws the incentive to you, they should put different ones on the people well, after that. Yeah. Yeah. You don't even do that. It's just, yeah. that's, the, that's the problem of churn, isn't it, that we touched upon earlier. Okay, my last um, so question is if we are going to do two things, which is to reduce inequalities between and within regions, the spatial dimension, but also uh, put enough resources into the green transition, 
can we name some specific examples where we need public investment above all, whether it's parts of the country or sectors? I know we've talked about it before, but I'd like us to return to, you know, what specifically and concretely should be done, whether it's a particular transport problem in a particular part of the country or something else, or is it just general, for instance, home insulation, which is going to be such a big issue, and we just need to have a massive national effort. I'd like to have an understanding of, is it a national thing that's needed, or is it really very specifically in particular parts and sectors? Because I guess the question that lies behind that is, which we touched upon already, is agglomeration effects, cities and clusters. Is that going to be not just necessary, I think everyone would probably say it is, but is it going to be sufficient to bring about leveling up? Or do we also need to think of other mechanisms because the spillover effects, you know, from those things, cities and clusters may be more limited than perhaps we previously thought. And therefore, what are we going to do for other areas that aren't going to benefit from city-based or cluster-based development? So that's sort of the, the question left behind the primary question. I, I think if you uh, um who's the professor of Sheffield who I have no reason, I haven't banked myself, but I have no reason to dispute it. But this view that agglomeration is terribly important is based again on American research yeah. where there is a, a fairly standard correlation between the size of the urban settlement or the city or whatever and the level of productivity. And of course, it always raises the issue of is this a selection thing, thing rather than a genuine, a genuine agglomeration. But anyway, McCann's work in the UK found no correlation whatsoever. London, yes, once you get outside London, you know, Birmingham is not particularly productive compared to smaller places like I mean, a big, small, productive place, um, Stevenage. So, so, you know, that, mm -hmm. The basic correlation doesn't hold in this country, and I think the I think uh, once you introduce the uncertainty about what causes the correlation anyway, I think there's no reason to get too excited about agglomeration as a as an economic policy. Um, put the stuff where you think it'll work, and that's not necessarily in the place. Um, just to give the other witnesses a chance on that, and then absolutely, absolutely I'll hand back uh, in no particular order. Actually. I think if I was um, still in the leveling up task force <laughs> and in the spirit of the, the white paper that yeah, and the chapter mm -hmm. one, which I, which I led on with Stephen's, uh, Stephen's help, um, I think I would say, you know, going with what you said, is you know, there is no one size fits all. I think. Often we ask the question about should we pick this sector or this region, but it's about equipping those sectors and regions with, you know, with the incentives and the tools that they need to then tailor it to, uh, you know, specific conditions. So you can't really, I mean, every region and, and the whole country has to transition to Nazi, which is a massive, massive challenge, and you would need you know, a set of mac uh, you know macro policy frameworks. You would need a set of standards. You need set of set of public and you know a combination of public and private investment. You would need a shift in consumer behavior. You know, and for that you have to take a multidisciplinary systems approach to understanding what works. You can't you know go what we have tended to do for many years is just look at it in a very linear fashion and say, you know, these are the best. We, we know what sectors matter for net zero, but for every place, the combination, the ingredients and the mix will be different. So, you know, you can't just say, okay, this transport will work in every sector, every every city and town in the same way. You might need a mass transit in one place, you might not in the other one. Well, we're coming towards the end of what has been a fascinating session. As I said earlier on, we've got a lot of things here we've learned that we're going to follow up on. Some of the points made by my witnesses have been very helpful and some of the points have actually been challenged in the chat. But our process today is not to challenge what the witnesses are saying, but learn learn from you, think about it, and possibly come back later 
And if I want to come in with one question, I've got to check that Andy is also content. The last person I want to upset is Andy. Yeah. Who wants to come in is very welcome. But Mark, do you want to have a But I have one final question as well after that. So yeah, I wanted to come back. Uh, this is where it started. It's just this uh, six capitals concept from 1108 white paper. Maybe this is actually then a question for you because, and you, you came back to it later when you were talking about, you know, if you talk about the capitals and you think more broadly around this, you also have to think about the outcomes and think yeah. differently about this as well. So, can we ever get our arms around this? I mean, just mm -hmm. let's be realistic. We're talking about physical capital, it's okay. You want Capital, we know a fair amount about the intangible capital, we know more about. We've got financial capital there, yeah. which sort of overlaps with physical mm -hmm. capital, it's not cumulative. There's social and institutional capital, which again, you know, how do we get our arms around this? And then, secondly, the outcome part of it is, as, as you know, you rightly said, we probably have to think differently about what the outcome is, what's the outcome yeah. that you're after, which is some concept of societal productivity beyond GDP kind of thing. So, we're putting up a huge agenda here. Uh, and my question, I think, to you is, you know, given the fact that that will be a huge challenge to do, are we moving in the right direction as long as we're sort of driving on just a few cylinders of those six capitals, and perhaps not at all the six capitals from an investment? So I'll tell you what, what you know, what um, the way I'm thinking about evaluation in the context of UK infrastructure bank because we've got financial capital and we are using that to in physical capital, but we also know that the other things matter. Mm -hmm. So you know when we come to understanding how we evaluate that, I'm going to be asking precisely that question: like how do we how do we do that? But equally, the the bank cannot well the bank cannot overclaim or underclaim our role in the wider ecosystem. So we need to understand it, but we've got to at least try because it's a, it's a way of thinking that is becoming more and more, you know, uh, sort of, it, it's, this, this way of thinking probably wasn't around even 10 years ago, mm -hmm. but there are case studies out there that we can learn from, you know, and, We've got we've got to at least try to understand. And yes, we, we probably have to break it into chunks to understand it. But and I can't tell you what my evaluation would say or what you know what the best ways of capturing that that would say. I'll put it slightly differently. I mean, I, I'm in much in favor of trying yeah. this. I'm not pushing back on the idea. But how if you take the positions in, at, at, at the infrastructure bank? How do you take these difficult capital concepts into account? In you still life? have to hold on to uh, some tangible ways of measuring it. And, you know, so as part of the impact framework, we have actually published a whole suite of metrics that we think are going to help us measure and evaluate impact. And it's a long list, but we have the choice and flexibility as we, mm -hmm. as we execute our more, more of our portfolio and more of our financial capacity and you know, have our initial evaluations. We'll say, okay, but, but the size of the, you know, like the prize is ultimately productivity, living standards, you know, on the way to net zero and achieving local economic growth. So we are not we are not taking our eyes on the price. Yeah. We just we're just saying that in getting there, we have to think of these other things as well. I think this is something we're going to have to return to on how we assess ex ante the returns from different bits of investment. to look into more detail in the UK. Like we do yeah. how the European Investment Bank continues to do yeah. it and yeah. did it in the UK. As, as well as other organizations think about these impacts. I mean, at the Institute itself, Adrian is leading a project uh, funded by the Nuffield Foundation on, on using dashboards to try and understand these things. You can't always no. add up apples and pears. No. And that's something I know we talked about before. But let, let's return to that because we, I want to finish with one question to each of you, but at the same time, thank you for what has been a really wonderful discussion with commissioners, Stephen Aldridge, Catherine Mann, and Paul for joining as well, if I may say so. Samiri and uh, Max Harvey for helping us put this session together. But let me absolutely leave the final words to witnesses. And we have a question from a colleague and a friend at uh, Treasury, uh, Alawiz uh, Yip uh, Lip. And I think it refers to a number, it sort of encapsulates a number of things we've come across um, this afternoon. I think there's agreement we need more. 
public investment. And there's a separate point about the difficulty of assessing public investment and the nature of specificity, because it depends on a bunch of other things that we don't measure very well. And so the point here is that if we make the statement we need more public investment, but we have to make that case to a political decision maker via the Treasury, what evidence do we have that it's going to work ex ante? And how could we therefore get a government to commit? We heard from Jan that we need maybe four, five, six, seven percent a year. I think what's even more important than just the number is the commitment, the, the, the certainty that it's going to happen year on year. The volatility in those paths, paths is, seems to be just as problematic as the low level. But if we're going to commit or tie the hands of the government over time and over different parliaments on what is a limited evidence base, I sort of worry about how we can bring that around. If you were sitting right now, as you may well be next week in your, uh, at, at number 11, trying to make the case, how would you make the case for the quantum and the commitment at a time when I disagree with the fundamental point that we have got limited fiscal headroom? But that's certainly the narrative out there. So that's my final question. Any aspect of that? And sort of, maybe I'll start with Jan, uh, given that um, we're speaking from overseas. and. Um, you're free to speak your mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. So, uh, I think it's very difficult. Uh, <laughs> very wise, very wise <laughs> I think it's a very difficult question that you, you asked there. Um, I think just looking at the experience in Europe, I think um, after the austerity period, uh, countries that had a very low share of public investment in output, I think they've come to realize that um, public infrastructure can can crumble. I think you see it, you saw it in Germany, uh, in the US too, I think you hear about stories about crumbling bridges, um, really big bottlenecks in, 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 um, in, in, in the highway system. I think people are well aware now that that, that, that there has been uh, shortcomings in, in public investment and that this is holding back uh, growth. I think the, the bigger challenge is I think how to convince governments how much more investment is needed for the green transition. I think this is really challenging. We see it now also in the protests against some of the green measures in the Netherlands, the farmers union in France, of course, the protests against uh, against green measures. I think it's very difficult to, yeah, to convince the politicians uh, that, this, that this is needed. And um, I think it's for us as economists to make this case and to, to show the probably the good examples of where it has helped and where it has worked and the damaging examples of where uh, a lack of investment has uh, held back countries. But I think this is the, the big challenge for us as economists. That's all I'd like yeah. to say about this. That's it's an important challenge. Uh, Nigel, Jerry, and I'm conscious of the opportunity to do this in about 30 seconds. Yeah. So at a macro level, the first question is, what's the ROI on saving the planet? You know, we as a society, we basically have to solve two things, three things. But transport, and I was going to say transport and heating, but actually in a lot of parts of the world, it's not heating, it's cooling. Mm. But it's, we have to solve, if we don't solve that, we're all going to do it. Mm. Right? Yeah. Now, people who want to be elected, need to understand that their role then is to generate a consensus internationally. You know, if you want to be a leader of a Western democracy, you have to do that. If you don't, if you don't want to do that, don't be a leader of a Western democracy, do something else, be a fund manager or something. Yeah. Right? So we, we have to do that. Now, at a micro level, what does that do for Stoke? Okay, well, what that can do for Stoke is to say, right, well, Stoke has certain skills around ceramics. You need ceramics for certain forms of conductivity. So if we upskill Stoke in certain things, you can then have a transition in the Stoke economy. And you can tell the same thing, the story about Coventry or Burnley or, or wherever it is. So it's, it's, the, it's bringing, hey, we're in the National Institute, bringing the micro and the macro together. <laughs> To, to answer that question, that's that's how I'd go about doing it. Thank you very much. Bearing in mind, I would never stand for public office. I just like pronouncing. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, I, I don't think there's anyone in this room. That's why we do what we do. Jerry. 
<laughs> yeah, I think you have to combine a, a, a horror story. If you can't frighten them, you've got no hope. <laughs> uh, having frightened them, you've got to offer you've got to offer the hope that you know, so that, that they just don't lapse into passivity and despair yeah. and just think about the next next week's headline. Headline. So um, if they think that the current course of the British economy is sustainable, either socially, economically, never mind ecologically, yeah. you know, you need to tell them that they they really need to wake up and uh, and stop living in a world of their own because it clearly is not sustainable. We were over financialized within the economy. We abandoned competitive advantage in so many sectors. Uh, we have a public sector that's universally run down, and we have a, a, a population with widespread indigency and poverty. And I mean, this isn't this is not a success story, and it's, it doesn't appear to be getting any better. So you, you've got to do something, right? I mean, it's a horror show. So you basically scare them, and then you need, as you said, you've got to, you then have to offer some lines of advance, uh, uh, which would include reorganizing the way we categorize borrowing, but also reforming the tax system in order to mobilize more resources for public investment. And um, you know, you're only doing it because there's no alternative. You're not doing it because it's easy or you like it. There is an alternative. That's, that's the line we need to adopt. That sounds very familiar, Joe. Um, uh, I to say that's, uh, I think you've just written the next commentary from the National Institute of Economic Review, so I'm going to come to you. <clears throat> and actually, last word, please. Much as I like the horror genre, uh, <laughs> I, I would take a slightly different approach because uh, I work very closely with Treasury colleagues all the time. So I think it's, uh, it's important to give, you know, our Treasury polit our political master the size of the prize as well. Mm -hmm. What is yeah, the prize? I think it's, a, mm -hmm. it's, you know, uh, look what we would achieve if we were to do this. And that's a very different narrative, but um, it works sometimes. Yeah. So, so, so it sounds like two counterfactuals. One is, if exactly. you do nothing, this is where do nothing is up. important. Very important, yeah. but yeah. I think the, the the prize that you get from doing nothing versus the prize mm. that you would take some action, uh, you know, it is also a powerful message. The other thing is, and this is mainly for us economists, I think, um, is that we uh, suffer from path dependency in looking at evidence in very narrow ways we perhaps need to look at like you were saying you know uh, dashboards but mm -hmm. we have we need to work with data scientists we need to work with other disciplines to really paint the picture of you know the case for investment and uh more real-time insights not wait for that perfect um uh, you know what's the the top of the Maryland scale? Uh, you know, uh, and we need to be we need to be in the mode of experimenting and learning what works a lot more. Like you know, and this is something that again going back to my role in the bank and the way the CEO of the bank thinks about it. Like we need to be in learning mode and then sharing and sort of disseminating that learning a lot more because then that becomes. You know, you've got a bunch of case studies to work from, and that could be from international experiences as well as from. Yeah. And I think that creates that creates more avenues to then present your case um, in different ways. Well, very hard to do it. Thank you. I know Jerry has to go. Thank you for staying at the end talk. So we thank the witnesses and all the contributors and the commissioners. We'll have an evidence session in a couple of months on FDI. Uh, but we'll certainly learn the lessons from what we've learned today, share the transcript and our views, and continue the important work of the Commission. Um, as ever, grateful for the support of the Productivity Institute in Manchester, funded by the EHRC. Thank you all very much. But in the session, there is going to be some water. Thank you.